This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. I'm Sophie Ikenye. Our top stories. A new government needed. Mali's Prime Minister resigns along with his cabinet following an upsurge of violence and protests in the country. No. Everyone, the government, majority leaders and members of the assembly, everyone should be here today to say together no to confusion, no to barbarity. Funerals in Libya's capital Tripoli as a rogue general continues his assault on the city. The UN-backed Prime Minister condemns the silence of allies. A year after Swaziland was renamed as Eswatini, we visit the country to find out why the name change is costing millions. Selling African designers, supermodel Naomi Campbell goes to Lagos to highlight the fashion on the continent. African designers deserve the right to be champion just like every other designers around the world. And in sport, ex-Ghana international Otto Ado joins the former club Borussia Dortmund as talent coach. Thanks for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. We begin in Mali, where the entire government has resigned following an upsurge of violence in the country and pressure from protesters. President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita has accepted the resignations and said a new prime minister would be named soon and that a government would be put in place after consultations. Now, earlier this week, the president addressed the nation and said he had heard the anger. BBC's Louise Duast reports. Thousands in the streets of the capital were demanding change, demanding a change in government, who they say has failed to resolve insecurity problems and who have made living conditions worse. They were joined by politicians and influential religious leaders. Protesting in Mali because there have been massacres should not be a crime. We should not seek authorization to protest, no. Everyone, the government, majority leaders and members of the assembly, everyone should be here today to say together no to confusion, no to barbarity. No à la confusion. Overnight, Prime Minister Soumelou Boubé Maiga, who had been a target of these protesters, announced his resignation. No official reason was given, but legislators had discussed a possible motion of no confidence in the government to take place today. There's been mounting pressure on the government since March, after 160 people were killed in central Mali. The attack was believed to have been carried out by a vigilante group made up of men from the Dogon ethnic group, allegedly against another group, the Fulanis. The Fulani community says they are targeted because of suspected links to Islamist groups. Some of them have been accused of carrying out attacks. Authorities did detain suspects in the March massacre, but they failed to disarm the militia despite pledges to do so. Mali has been struggling to contain violence since Islamist extremists gripped the north of the country in 2012. Despite ongoing military operations, these groups are still active in the north and new groups have emerged in the east and center of the country. And that was Louise Devaster reporting there. Well, let's bring in jean Eve Jezekel, the director of the Sahel Project at the International Crisis Group. He joins us from Dakar. Thanks for taking time to talk to us on the program. So there are hostilities uh, um, between ethnic communities, and of course there is the jihadist influence. Break that down for us and what kind of relationships they have. Well, you know, the, the resignation of the Prime Minister takes place in, uh, in the context of rising intercommunal violence in Central Mali in the last few months, especially, uh, as you just said, between the Dogon, who are mostly farmers, and the Fulani, Fulani communities, who are mostly herders. Uh, I mean, it should be clear that violence hit every community in a cycle of reprisal, um, but the Fulani are hit harder, mostly because they are accused of uh, siding with jihadi groups. Uh, which is only partly true. Uh, some jihadi groups, especially the Katiban Masina, especially active in Central Mali, have indeed actively attempted to recruit among the Fulani, but they have only recruited a minority of them. Conversely, uh, some Dogon, who are mostly 
farmers, minority of Togo have joined the ranks of local militias that collaborate with the Malian army against these GND groups. Mm. So the violence mm. takes an ethnic dimension, but there is a, a, a broader a broader context that gives sense to uh, to this violence. Oh. And there's a fight between the government and the GID groups. So uh, that, that obviously puts uh, puts the, uh, the the president in a very tight position, really. Um, he says he will appoint a new government. Who should he be looking for, ideally, to restore the people's confidence? And can he really get them? Well, you know, first of all, this is, you know, the, the fifth uh, prime minister uh, who have been serving under President Keita uh, since he was elected uh, six years ago. Uh, so this is not really a, a stable uh, position. Uh, Prime Minister Maiga has been pretty active, especially in trying to restore state, state presence in, in both central and northern Mali. Uh, but it will take a much stronger, much better, less corrupt state uh, to restore the legitimacy of the, of, of the state. Right now, uh, um, the international community is pressuring President Ibeka to uh, reform the constitution, to adjust this constitution to the peace agreement that was signed four years ago. So I believe that um, the president right now is looking for somebody who can organize a referendum initially planned for next June. So it's, it's likely that he's going to, choose to look for a consensual figure or somebody from the opposition who can create a, some kind of a government of national unity. All right. And just very quickly, the president, um, in a televised address on Tuesday, said he had had the anger. That statement seemed to be appeasing the country. Has he managed to do that quickly? Well, it's, it's way too soon to say that he, is, uh, he has appeased. I guess that, you know, the, the resignation of uh, the prime minister, Maiga, is, um, is one way to appease uh, the situation. But once again, it's been years now that the situation is deteriorating of uh, the situation is deteriorating in Mali, and it will take more than just changing one guy and his team to change the situation in substance. All right. Jean Ravé Jezequiel, thank you for taking time to talk to us on Focus on Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's emerged that U.S. President Donald Trump has spoken by phone to Libya's Eastern Commander General Khalifa Haftar, whose forces are attacking the country's capital. Mm -hmm. Now, the White House says the two men discussed a shared vision for Libya's transition to democracy. But according to the World Health Organization, more than 200 people have been killed since fighting began on the 4th of April. Ola Gerin reports from Tripoli. In Tripoli, once again, it's time to bury the dead. Civilians killed this week by rocket fire as they slept. Mourners blame the military strongman besieging the city, General Khalifa Haftar. Critics say he wants to be a new Gaddafi. Prime Minister Siraj. Very nice to see you again. Libya's internationally recognized prime minister has held him off for two weeks with the help of a loose alliance of militias. But he's sounding worried. This is a dangerous turning point. It's a confrontation between supporters of democracy and supporters of authoritarian rule. I am really astonished by the stand of the international community. It's less a matter of taking a stand and more of dodging a bullet. These battles are raging around seven miles from the Prime Minister's office. But the international community, which was so hands-on during Libya's revolution, now has little to say. There are divisions within the international community. Some countries support the government. They recognize that there is an attack taking place. Other countries don't have the courage to acknowledge that. We do not want this division to cause the international community to abandon Libya as it did in 2011. What is the risk now that the so-called Islamic State can exploit this vacuum? They were driven from their stronghold in Sirte at the end of 2017, but nobody imagines that they're gone completely. 
بالتاكيد هناك تداعيات اخرى لهذه لهذا الاعتداء Definitely there is a fear that extremist elements terrorist elements may return بالفعل هناك Some cells left cert and will certainly take advantage of the security vacuum We fought and vanquished ISIS in cert Now the attack on Tripoli has given these cells the opportunity to reawaken What about your personal safety prime minister what do you think might happen to you if general Haftar managed to take control here I am living in the capital among three million Libyans who are defending their city. What happens to them will happen to me. But we will fight to the death to defend our dream of establishing a democratic civilian state. The battle for Tripoli may have an impact far beyond Libya's shores. The Prime Minister says it's threatening the lives of 800,000 migrants here and could spark a flood to Europe. Orla Guerin, BBC News, Tripoli. Well, let's now take a look at other stories making the headlines across Africa. A court in the Democratic Republic of Congo has scrapped a three-year jail term for opposition leader Moïse Katumbi. The decision by the Supreme Court of Appeal overturns a sentence for alleged property fraud and means that means he can now return from self-imposed exile in Belgium. Meanwhile, the so-called Islamic State group has announced a new branch called Central Africa Province after it claimed its first attack in the Democratic Republic of Congo. In a statement, IS said it carried out an operation against Congolese army positions in Kamango, killing and injuring several security members. Now, at least 13 people have died and dozens injured when a wall collapsed on the congregation at a church in South Africa's KwaZulu-Natal province. Members of the Pentecostal church were attending a weekend long Easter service. Um, there are reports that some of the victims were sleeping when the brick wall fell. It's thought heavy rainfall may have been the cause. The Liberian president, George Weir, has been forced to work from home after two black snakes were discovered in his building. Now, the entire Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where his office is located, has been evacuated and is being fumigated. There are many poisonous snakes in the country, so no chances were taken. Now, the Sudanese Professional Association has announced plans to form a new ruling structure made up, made up of civilians as they continue to push for the military to relinquish power. The protest movement, which was behind the ousting of Omar al-Bashir one week ago, have now turned on the military council, who they now accuse of hijacking their revolution. Now, the military council, on the other hand, says it's ready to meet some of the protesters' demands, but has indicated it would not hand over power to the protest leaders. Demonstrators are adamant they want the top military leaders brought to justice. The first president installed by the coup was perhaps worse than Bashir, so we ousted him as well. The one who followed him is giving us concessions that might satisfy some of our demands. But they've not been implemented in reality. Our key demand is that the group who are in charge before are held to account. We want them to return the money stolen from the Sudanese people and release all the detainees. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Still to come, who will be the next BBC Women's Footballer of the Year? You decide will tell you how. I'm Sophie Ikenye and you're watching Focus on Africa from BBC World News. The top story on this program, a political crisis in Mali as the country's entire government resigns following an upsurge in violence and protests. Exactly a year ago today, the small southern African nation of Swaziland was renamed Eswatini. Africa's last absolute monarch, King Muswati III, made the decree during celebrations to mark 50 years of independence. While many citizens embraced the name Eswatini, the cost of rebranding has hampered a total makeover and it has also been contested in court. Our business editor Larry Mador reports. <laughs> Eswatini's fascinating culture draws in hundreds of thousands of tourists from around the world to the landlocked nation every year. 
at the capital Mbabane's crop market, artisans are seeing renewed interest in their wares after the kingdom's name changed from Swaziland to Eswatini. They were confusing us with Switzerland, and now we finally got a name. King Mswati III abruptly ordered the name change last April, catching most of the world by surprise. His own government has struggled to keep up, with some buildings and even ministries still using the old name. But being known as a Swatini is a matter of national pride, and the renaming was announced on the symbolically important 50th anniversary of independence from British rule. We actually did not change the name. We reclaimed it. Before, before Swaziland became a British protectorate, it was called the Swatini. And then when the, uh, when, the, when the English people came here, they changed it to Swaziland. I'm sure it was simply because they, they wanted the situation whereby they would be able to pronounce it Swaziland. It may be internationally recognized now, but Eswatini's top-level domain, that's the country's unique identity on the internet, is still .sz for Swaziland, highlighting the difficulty of changing a country's name. The old currency is still in circulation, and new passports have not been printed. But for many Maswati, they're just happy to have dropped what they considered a colonial name. Now Swaziland wants to be known by its original name. Eswatini. The name change to Eswatini makes me very happy because I'm Swati and I'm from Eswatini. The name Eswatini has a lot of support among ordinary citizens, but there are those in the opposition and within the trade unions who dispute that it was the kingdom's original name, and many also point out that under the country's new constitution, the king can't make such a decree. Several African countries changed their names after independence, such as Gold Coast, which became Ghana, Nyasaland is now Malawi, and Burkina Faso was once Upper Volta. Eswatini may be singing a new tune now, but this rebranding may cost several million dollars and take a few more years, a high price, especially for a country of just 1.3 million people. Larry Medowo, BBC News, Mbabane. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. Let's find out what's happening in the world of sport. Peter. Many thanks, Sophia. And German side Borussia Dortmund say they are excited about the return of their former fallen ex Ghana international Otto Addo as talent coach. The 43 year old's role will be to serve as a link between the youth and senior teams. Addo has worked in a similar position for Borussia Mönchengladbach since 2017. He becomes the latest African to land a top job in Europe after Ivorian legend Kolo Ture joined English side Leicester City. Now, if you follow your favorite footballer on social media, you may have noticed uh, he or she may have been a bit quieter today. That's because professional footballers in England and Wales are boycotting social media for 24 hours to protest against the way social networks and football authorities respond to racism. Arsenal players Alex Iwobi, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang and Tottenham Hotspur's Victor Wanyama have all tweeted in support of the PFA's Enough campaign organized by the Professional Footballers Association. It's a response to an apparent upsurge in racist incidents in football this year. Now, the BBC has launched this year's BBC's Women's Footballer of the Year Award. It's the fifth year of the award, which is, was won last year by England's Lucy Bronze. The winner is voted for by you, the public. So here's your chance to decide which of these five players should take the title this year. Hey, I'm uh, Pernil Mosegård Harder, and I play for Farfell Wolfsburg in Germany, uh, and I'm a forward. Harder, schöner Doppelpass. Abgefest! I think I always dreamed about it. I wrote an a essay when I was like 10 years that I wanted to be the best player in the world. And I've always been working hard for it, but I, I'm not sure I thought that it really would happen. My name is Ado Stosmeegberg. I'm a striker for Olympic Lyonnais in France. Allez. Ouais, bien joué! La tête et le but! L'ouverture du score pour l'OL féminin! Yeah, I grew up in a, in a family with uh, equal rights. I have a mom which gave me that voice, my dad as well, and I never looked at myself as different than a man's footballer. I'm Lindsay Horan. I play midfield. I play for the Portland Thorns and the U.S. Women's National Team. Kind of wanted to take with the laces there. Sinclair seeing if she 
can find a little football was everything to me. Sometimes I would, I would miss class so I could go watch Champions League. It shows a passionate young girl that, you know, wanted to watch games, wanted to go train extra and do all these things. Sam Kerr, striker, Chicago Red Stars, Australia. I think my best skill is my pace. I play off a lot of instinct and sometimes think quicker than a lot of people and I don't think maybe it's a skill but it's just something that I'm gifted with having, you know, quick instincts and I guess being a goal sneak. Je m'appelle Saki Kumagai, du jeu milieu de terrain à Olympique Lyonnais et Japon. I take pleasure from football. It's life and it's my passion. If football doesn't exist, I can't express myself. Without football, life is less interesting and too serious. So the vote is now open. Go to bbc.com slash women's football and make your choice for who you think should win the BBC Women's Footballer of the Year Award. You can find full details on our privacy notice on the BBC Sports website. You know, Sophie, I reckon if you put on your boots, you'd be, be on that list. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every year I keep telling you I might just get inspired. Ah, there you go. So I hope this is the year. Let's hope so. <laughs> Thanks for the support, Peter. Thank you. Now, international supermodel Naomi Campbell has travelled to Lagos to launch Arise Fashion Week. That's an event that showcases diversity and the best fashion designers from across Africa. Speaking to the BBC's Mayeni Jones, she began by explaining why it's important for her to keep coming back to the West African country. Well, last year I was here as just Naomi, doing Arise as a model. This year I'm in partnership with Arise, so it's an Arise with Naomi Campbell. And this year we've brought some people, other designers and editors from America, from London, from Europe, and we want the world to know and see and to be able to get out there the perception, to change the perception they have, then to see the young emerging designers from all across Africa. Because they're talented and these African designers deserve the right to be champion just like every other designers around the world. Do you think Africa should have a global fashion capital like Milan or Paris? Do you think that might help? Yes, it would be good. Um, it would be good if uh, we could have that here. Right now we've got many different fashion weeks, but right now what's important is that we get the, in, the outside fashion brands to recognize this continent as African, this continent recognizes their brands, a part of making their brands who they are. We have a huge influence in what we wear and how we wear it. Which African city do you think could be a potential? It's difficult. It's a big continent. Mm. So for me, I really, I want to cross all ticks, tick all boxes. It has to be north, east, south and west. Mm. So it'd be like a rotating It has thing. to be. What do you make of Western designers using some of these African textiles it's great and designs? if you give the credit. Do you think that that's cultural appropriation? I haven't really thought about it like that. I just think of it as a simple, very simplistic in the sense of just if you're going to do it, give the credit. Why do you think Western designers have been reluctant to credit African textile makers? And Because we haven't really, partly our fault, actually. Um, as you say, we've got no real center, but now we do, and we're, we're, now we have, and uniting on all fronts and coming together and opening ourselves to letting people come and see what we have here is the, only, the best way to do it, and little by little, that's what's going to happen. Well, before we go, a quick look at our top story today on Focus on Africa. Mali's entire government, including the Prime Minister, has resigned following an upsurge of violence in the country and pressure from protesters. That's all from the program. From me and the rest of the Focus on Africa team, thanks for your company.